I want to talk to you this morning on the nature of church membership. Joining a church is a type of covenant. So I want to talk about that for a few minutes. Uh, and this, there's no notes to take. There's uh, nothing uh, to write down unless you choose to write something down that you hear this morning. Uh, I just really want you to concentrate on what I'm trying to tell you this morning. A covenant is a promise or a pledge. Uh, the word covenant occurs in the English Standard Version of the Bible 316 times. Of that, 282 are found in the Old Testament. And there are five biblical covenants mentioned in the Scripture. There's the Noahic covenant, which is what? A rainbow in the sky that promises never again will the world be destroyed by water. So every time it rains, we get a rainbow, and that rainbow is representative of a covenant that God made with Noah after they got out of the ark and said, no more will I do this. That's the Noahic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant, you go to a place, I'm going to build a big nation out of you, you obey me. He left paganism and followed the voice of the Lord. There's the Davidic covenant. And then there's a covenant God made with the nation of Israel to be their God and they would be his people. And then you get into the New Testament and there's the new covenant. Jesus says, I give you a new covenant. And so five different covenants are mentioned in the scripture. And a covenant is like an agreement, but a, solid, a, sol, a solemn covenant agreement not a cheap agreement not it's an important agreement that you make with god the word covenant uh the new testament version of the word talks about a cutting and in the old testament if you read the stories of abraham where they split an animal in half and laid the two parts uh against each other and uh abraham passed through the middle of the beast and and so did the the presence of the lord pass through the middle of the animal that was separated. It's called a cutting of a covenant. Uh, of the 34 times it appears, I'm going somewhere. I'm losing you, I can tell. I'm going somewhere. Uh, of the 34 times it shows up in the New Testament, 11 of those, I mean 17, half, one half, 17 of those times are in the book of Hebrews. Because in the book of Hebrews, the writer is writing to Hebrew Christians and he's comparing the old with the new, the old with the new, the old with the new. Telling them to hold on to what they have in the new covenant because it's better than the old covenant. However, the letter is to, is to draw them into a deep relationship with God so that they don't give up. They're suffering a lot of persecution the call is, what's the use? Why bother? Let's just go back to where we were. We're saved. Let's just go back to where we were and do the old thing. And he's saying, no, 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 no. It's better for you now. Some covenants are conditional. You do this, God does that. Some are unconditional. In fact, I want you to know that salvation is a covenant. Here's what God promises. God promises that if you put your total trust in him, repenting of your sin, that he will save you. He will save your soul. He will give you eternal life. That's a promise God makes. It's like a covenant relationship with us. God, by the way, keeps his word. You'll get eternal life and forgiveness of sin. Well, church membership is like that. It's a covenant relationship. And every church I've ever been a part of, has had a written covenant somewhere in their documents. Some of you in this church may never have seen ours. You're going to, but some of you have never seen it. Some of you can't remember the last time you saw it. But in our church documents, there are the Constitution, which is the covenant and the doctrinal statement of our church, and then there are the bylaws, which is how our church operates, the very first article in our Constitution is the covenant. And I'm going to talk about that today. But first I want to read 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse number 12. 
2 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 12, is Paul is describing the church. He's using an, an analogy, an illustration of the human body. Here's what he says, beginning in verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of the, that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not the hand, I am not a part of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I am not the body, is, there, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. Let's pray. Father, I hope that you will help me strip myself of my own personal conclusions and present a clear presentation of just what you fashioned when you fashioned the church. Help me to understand and deliver clearly uh, the message you have laid on my heart. Bring clarity to a situation that may have a murkiness to it. In Jesus' name, amen. When we describe those who attend church, there are basically four words that describe those who attend church. First of all, there's a community. In our community, we live in a community around about us, and sometimes people from the community come to church, visit the church. The community is what we hope to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The community is what is out there the at large around us. And then there is the crowd. And the crowd is be, well, whoever attends church on any given Sunday morning. We have people that come in. Sometimes people are members. Sometimes they're guests. Sometimes they're strangers. Sometimes whatever. They're just a crowd of people that show up on Sunday morning. And then there are the committed, and then the last one is the core. And the core of a church is, uh, or are the people who function so that the church functions. What you don't realize, what I realize and thank God for every Sunday morning when I pray with my prayer pals on Sunday morning, is that I thank God for all of the people who are ministering right now in our church. It started this morning, and they're continuing all the way through right now. There are people you don't see because they have chosen to minister in the back, whether it's the nursery or the children's department or whatever. Those people, the people who open doors for you, the people who hand you bulletins, the people who teach classes, all of that is the core of the church, making the church operate on Sunday morning. The people who come up and sing in the choir, all of those are functioning so the church functions in its purpose. Some are seen. Some are unseen. All of them are important to the actions or the activity of our local church here, Marsh Lane Baptist Church. Those who attend and those who have joined, there is different responsibilities and benefits to both. I love people to come to church, and we're going to talk a little bit about this in a minute. Um, in fact, let me do it right now. Let me be clear about this. You ready? Anyone can attend this church. Anyone can attend this church. Whether they are committed to Christ or uncommitted to Christ. If they're walking in obedience or walking in rebellion, uh, it doesn't matter. The doors are open to every person who would walk through them and be a part of our church. To come in and worship and be a part of the crowd. Anyone can attend our church. Saved or lost. Doesn't matter. We want everybody to come to church. That make, that's clear, right? However, not anyone can join our church because there are stipulations as to what constitutes church membership, and we'll talk about those. 
But anybody is welcome to come in. And by the way, our church, if you haven't experienced this yet, our church, after you've been here a couple times, we just assume that you're part of us and we love you and enjoy your presence and treat you. Did I get an amen from somebody? Anyone can attend church. In fact, it is in our best interest that lost people come to church. It is in our best interest that backslidden people come to church. Because the Bible says this, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. The word of God. All right? So that's it. Our church is open. Uh, here's, here's, anybody can come. As They've got to be alive. They've got to be dressed. And they have to be not disruptive. I mean, we're not interested in having people come in and, and break up the service or any of that. Thank God. I've never had that happen in my ministry. I do know that there have been churches where people have actually come in and tried to disrupt the services of a church. Uh, if that happens, uh, then our deacons, our men, will move and uh, politely and carefully uh, show them the door. And if somebody gets in and starts screaming something in church, here's the best thing we can do. Everybody in the church stand up and start singing Amazing Grace. <laughs> Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like you. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't do that. that. That was a joke. That was a joke. I am not going to go into the benefits and requirements of church membership, although uh, we will touch on uh, what it means to be, how you become a member, that kind of stuff. But this message is really about the nature of church membership, the nature of being a member of a church. And now this is uh, uh, what I'm, I want to do. And to start with this, I have to confess to you a failure on my part. I, like many of my profession, have dropped the ball in teaching this important truth. I think what has happened is it's, sed it's seductive and it's deceitful. The desire to draw a crowd becomes more important than growing a Christian. And I think that what we think is, and I'm talking about preachers now, is that if we call for this kind of commitment, the same thing's going to happen to us that happened to Jesus in John chapter 6. John chapter 6 had a big crowd. He fed them the day before. They chased him around the lake. They're there for breakfast, and they're getting all over him. A big crowd. I'm talking about a big crowd. Jesus had a mega church. And he turned and looked at them. And he says to them, Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot be a part of me. Now, that's a solid commitment. You need to be totally committed to me or you're out. They turned away. They turned around and walked away from him and no big crowd. He went from having a mega church to a minor church just like that. And some of us are a little worried that when we do that, <clears throat> people walk away. But the idea is we are to grow Christians, not just draw a crowd. Remember, I like the crowd. You're welcome. Anybody's welcome. You got people out there, you let them come. Tell them. Anybody says, can I come to your church? You say, absolutely. Anybody's welcome to come to our church. We are a multi-generational, cross-racial church. We want anybody to come. We, we want everybody to come. But because I think I failed in this area, what are we supposed to do with our failures? We're supposed to face them and fix them. And so I've just confessed my failure, and now I'm attempting to fix it. And I want to talk to you something serious this morning, because church membership is not joining a club. You don't join, pay your dues, receive your benefits. The church is not a club. It's not a club. 
It's not like any other human organization on earth. The church is a living, living organism. It is a body, the body of Jesus Christ on earth, functioning as a body. It is a family of faith. And like all families, there are leaders in families and followers in families and all family members have certain responsibilities, requirements, or benefits. Joining the church is not a practical decision. It is a spiritual decision. Before I came here, I was in the little town called Tuscola. Anybody know where Tuscola is? Tuscola, south of Babylon, on, I mean, Highway 83. I'm going to get distracted here it's called chasing a rabbit <laughs> highway 83 goes from canada to mexico straight line <laughs> i don't make any you don't care do you <laughs> that so interests me that we did a vacation after i was here we did a vacation where we went up highway 83 just to see the little town by the way you know what's in the middle of our country Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Tuscola, when I got to Tuscola, went and set up a bank account, and the guy who was a partner in the bank at that time ended up buying the whole bank. Talked to me, and he said, John, I'd like you to join the Lions Club with me. He was a member of the Lions Club, and so I joined the Lions Club. <clears throat> it's a little civic club. I don't know if any of you have been Lions. There was nothing altruistic about the decision I made to join the Lions Club. The church that I was called the pastor had had pastors before me who had left a bad taste in the mouth of the people of the town of Tuscola. Their character didn't match their message, and so they were looking at the church through the tainted eyes of a person's lack of character. And so what I thought was, if I join this civic organization and I demonstrate as a man of character and godliness that will help the, the church uh, restore its reputation. So I joined, I did everything a lion is supposed to do. In fact, the minute, the minute I joined, they make me the chaplain. I wonder why they do that. <laughs> we met, we planned things, we did things together. All of those men in that town saw the real John Hadley. That's a civic organization. Some of you may be part of a civic organization. That is not the church. That is not why you join a church. That is even how you join a church. A church is totally different than anything else we do. Human decision making is not the governing factor for you being a part of this church. Joining a church is, is more like being a part of a family. I was born into a family. I don't do, what do you call that stuff where you check your Jenny? I don't want to know who's in my family tree. <laughs> I'm afraid what's there. So I'm not interested in who was behind me. I'm interested in who's coming after me. I'm interested in what kind of you know, example I am setting and the legacy I'm leaving. But as a family, you're born into a family. And as a Christian, you're born again into God's family. The only people who should be members of this church, the crowd can be anybody, the only people who should be members of this church are people who are born again and know it. Because then we're a part of God's family. So I have to get saved. In fact, in my text of scripture, the scripture says that we were all baptized into one family by one spirit at the moment of our salvation. So you and I, who are born again, at the moment of that decision to trust Jesus Christ, the covenant God makes with us is, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to forgive your sins, I'm going to give you eternal life, and I'm going to make you part of my family. And that happens instantaneously when we get saved. 
So every born-again believer is a part of the family of God. You've been placed into Christ's body by the power of the Holy Spirit at the moment you were saved. However, being a part of the universal body of Christ does not afford you the opportunities to fulfill your Christian responsibilities totally. Because you need individuals you see face to face. You need individuals who see you face to face. You need individuals who need encouragement and love and correction and training. You need all of those things to fulfill the responsibilities of being a Christian. And the only way to fulfill those responsibilities is to be a part of the body of Christ, the local church. And so the local church, God in his wisdom gave us the local church where we could exercise our gifts and fulfill our responsibilities. And so you have to be a part of a local church. I, I am a local church guy. I am absolutely convinced that every believer, every true believer in Jesus Christ should be a part of a local church. That's who I am. That's what our church's position is. We just honestly believe that. The word church came from a political term. When Paul was writing and going to all these different cities, they had town hall meetings. We don't do that anymore in most places. They still do up in the Northeast. They'll have a town hall meeting. Everybody comes in. They come from their private homes to conduct public business. It's called an assembly. If you live in very small towns, they'll have cemetery associations where everybody comes out of their... <laughs> I know some of you, I just saw that smile. So I know you, you come out of your private homes, you meet together, you decide whatever about the... You, you know, that's the the assembly, the ecclesia, that word is what Paul used to describe the church. So uh, if you're called out of your private home to conduct public business, then think of it this way. As believers, we are called out of our private homes to conduct spiritual business. So Paul said that's a good way to refer to the church. And so he began just writing and referring to the church as the ecclesia, a called out body of believers to conduct public business in a church. The, uh, the only local church I'm concerned about today, however, is Marsh Lane Baptist Church. And it's made up of members who have been led to unite our church. They are believers. Uh, and we come together for this purpose, education, worship, edification, evangelism, whatever, take care of each other, encourage each other, to straighten out each other. All of those are legitimate reasons for a church. And in our text of scripture, it said this, the Spirit of God is putting people together as he determines. Now, why would he do that? Why would the Spirit of God be selecting people and putting them together as he determines? Because he sees the big picture. And remember the text I said was we're like a body and the body has all kinds of different parts and all of those parts have to function. I don't know if that was back. Let me get up here. Have to function effectively. So the Spirit of God knows what kind of parts he needs to put into the body so the body will function. And so you uh, end up with uh, something like this. Having been led, as we believe, by the Spirit of God to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and on profession of faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, we do now in the presence of God and angels in this assembly solemnly and joyfully enter into a covenant with one another as the body of Christ. Having been led by the Spirit of God. That's why I'm saying that just joining the church, if your decision was only human. I'm going to join this church because it has a decent children's program. I'm going to join this church because it's got a nursery. I'm going to join this church because it's a little bit of fun. I'm going to join this church because my dad is here, my mom is here. If your 
making a decision based upon human conditions, you're missing the point. The point, and by the way, I, my kids are here. I got Hadleys everywhere. I'm glad they're here. Some of you are going, oh me. But I don't want them to come because I'm here. In fact, most of them were here before I came here. But I, I, I want them to be here because they are absolutely convinced this is where the Spirit of God wants them. We want God to bring together into this community of faith that we call Mars Lane, this body of Jesus Christ that is functioning here on earth, we want the Spirit of God to fulfill the parts that are missing in our church, that need help in our church. We want Him to bring people into our midst. We commit, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Ghost, to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of the church in knowledge, holiness, comfort. Uh, to promote the prosperity and spiritual, spirituality, to sustain its worship, the ordinances, discipline, doctrines, to contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, um, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and spread of the gospel throughout the world. We also commit to maintain a personal life and all that. We're, you're going to get a copy of this. That's a covenant relationship. Where I come together with you, the, and by the way, I didn't choose this because of the pay. I didn't choose it because my children were here. I was convinced God led me here. That's why I'm here. Because I am convinced that God led me here. That's why you should join this church. And only why you should join this church. Now, I, I'm a little worried about this because... I had a group of people who left one church, 20-some, that came to a church I was pastoring and were there for months. They were all, two of them had been deacons in the other church, and the rest were solid members of the church. And after about 10, 12 weeks, I sent them a letter. And I said this to them. Surely, by now, you know what kind of church we are. Surely, by now, you know whether or not God wants you to be a part of this church. It's time to fish or cut bait. I don't know which one of those men leaving, but all 20 of them left. I would do it again today. If you can't figure out what kind of church Marceline is, now part of that's our fault, and we're going to correct it. But after a while, you pretty much know, is God leading me here? Is God really bringing me to this body? If he is, then jump in. By the way, I don't care if you attend forever. It's not my job to tell you to join this church. It's God's job to tell you to join this church. As church members, you place yourself under the authority of a local church. The Bible's clear about this. So here's what I have to say to you. If you do not trust the leadership of this church then you either have to do one of two things. You have to get your heart right with the person that you don't trust. Or you need to find a different church. Because we don't get to choose if we'll be submissive. It's stated for us. By the way, as I'm saying this, I'm realizing some of you who are visiting must think, boy, there's a hornet's nest going on here. <laughs> I just realized that. That is not true. I, I don't, I, by the way, if you don't trust me, I have no idea you don't. <laughs> I'm serious. So don't tell me. <laughs> Get it right. So don't, if you're visiting, don't think, oh my gosh. What a mess is going on. There is no mess going on here. What I realized is I was derelict in my duties of teaching you what it means to be a church member. And I'm correcting it. And as we go through this year, we are taking new steps so that everybody who comes into our church will fully understand what it means to be a church member what they're getting into. And part of the reason for that is people show up, they join, and then they disappear. 
I think that part of that is because they don't realize what they're joining. There is no problem. There is no fight. Uh, I ask the deacons all the time when we have a meeting, is there something going on I need to be known of? And they always tell me the same thing. No. Uh, you know the attitude we have in this building. We love each other. We care about each other. We do. Uh, by the way, some of us mess up. I know that. I've done it so much in my life. I, I, I understand that. We're not perfect. We don't have to be perfect because Jesus Christ was perfect for us. He wants to make us better than we are, though. Church functions under the authority of the Bible. The Bible is the most important document in the church. So if it, it, the, the lack of biblical knowledge today is killing us. When we join a church, we are making a covenant with other members to do certain things. It's solemn, solemn, sacred covenant as a member of the family. It's important for us to understand that. Having been led by the Spirit of God. Qualifications for a person to join this church are these. You have to be born again and know it. Now, I don't know your heart. And neither does anybody else in this church. You could be sitting here as lost as a goose in a snowstorm, and yet you've been a member of this church for 25, 30 years, and not one person knows it because you know how to speak, you know how to act, you know how to show up, you know how to do the thing. We don't do heart checks because we can't. Our job isn't to pull up unbelievers. Our job is to sow seeds and pray for a crop. Okay? But if you are a born-again believer and you know it, you have to give testimony to that fact. So when you're joining the church, I'll ask you, are you saved? Do you know you are a born-again believer? They say yes. Upon that profession is how a person becomes a member of the church. Have you been baptized by immersion since your salvation? No. Well, then you'll need to be baptized. Yes. Then you're, you come... If you know that God is leading you to this church, then you're brought in uh, to the membership. So that's the membership. There isn't a litmus test for any issue. There isn't a litmus test for any economic, any social, any racial, any uh, chronological. There's no litmus test for anybody. Anybody who walks into this building is a born-again believer and knows it has been baptized since they have been saved and are convinced that the Holy Spirit is leading them to join this church, welcome aboard. Because we've had difficulty, our policy for membership will change in a couple of months as we get things worked out. A candidate for membership will be given a copy of our new constitution and bylaws and asked to read it, and we will schedule an appointment with them. It's a pastoral appointment. One of us from the pa uh, pastoral staff or two of us will come you will have read the Constitution and bylaws, and you will say, I understand what you believe. I understand who you are. I know all of this stuff. Do you have any questions about any of this? Do you have any concerns about this? Do you have any problems with this? We'll go over those. Then we are going to have a new members class. And we're thinking right now, a Sunday afternoon, once a month or so, we'd have a new members class, last a couple hours, uh, we'll eat lunch or, or eat a meal, uh, go through the information so you know who, what, where we come from and all of that stuff. And then uh, upon completion of that class, in agreement to the aforementioned things, uh, you're welcome into the family of Marsh Lane Baptist Church. This is the way forward. We are redoing our Constitution and bylaws because they were more than 20 years old and things have changed and we want to do that. We've had a, an attorney helping us draw them up, so you're going to get them soon. You'll have a month uh, to look at them, to go over them. You talk to your deacon about whatever you find there, if you have any questions and all of that. But here's what I want to leave you with. God is no respecter of persons and neither are we. We want people to come to know Jesus Christ. I don't care what economic background they come from. I don't care what country they come from. I don't care what faith they come from. 
when they come to Christ, I just want people to come to know Jesus Christ. And then I want them to become a part of our family where we can learn how to exercise our faith with different types of people. When the early church had a difficulty. They, they had a difficulty with Jews who were living in Gentile country. They had a problem with them. They didn't like them. Here they are, the same people. They, and all of these people came to Jesus. And so they are all believers, but because they were Jews that lived in European countries, say, the, the purebreds of Israel didn't like them. They thought they were second-class people. And then we come to the book of James, and James is dealing with the church in Jerusalem and say, wait a minute. A guy comes in, he's, got, he's loaded, you know he's loaded. He's got every, every accoutrement of wealth on him, and you give him a privileged seat, and a guy comes in who's a slave, and you say, here, sit on the floor here. What is that, he says. That is not the way God does business. And it's not the way the church should do business. You see, when we stand at the foot of the cross, we confess our sin and claim Jesus Christ, the ground there is level. Whether you are Jew or Gentile, whether you are smart or dumb, whether you are rich or poor, it doesn't matter because we're all brought into the same family together and are to exercise that together. And if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I, I, I don't know why you wouldn't. He loves you so much. He sent his son to die on Calvary's cross in your place, suffered your humiliation, your penalty, for your sin so that he could wipe the slate clean for you when you came to him. Don't trust being a church member. Don't trust being a Christian family. Don't trust that somehow your good will outweigh your bad because the best things you can do, God says, are like rubbish. You only can trust the shed blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. Heavenly Father, we do ask you today, you do what needs to be done in our life. If we're walking in rebellion, help us become obedient. If we're crippled by sin, then help us to walk again. If we're lost, without hope of eternal life, then by your spirit, draw them to salvation. I know that you have a plan to build a strong and effective church right here on this block to keep us here preaching the gospel until you come. No doubt. You have preserved us for 80 plus years with men and women who believe the Bible who walk in faith, who've sacrificed financially and spiritually to provide for this church. And I know we're not going anywhere until you come for us. Bring us new people who will buy into what you've done here on this corner. Lead them here. Place them in our body. Give us the parts we're missing. And then help us all to be unified in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand.